let's begin with prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank you for another day in which to come and receive the, receive the gifts that you give through your Son, Jesus Christ. Give us your Holy Spirit to open our hearts and minds to your word that we might be strengthened and renewed in right faith, increase in us true wisdom, knowledge, understanding, and discernment that we will receive the salvation through faith alone in Christ. Today, especially, we pray for the family of Tom Mate. Give them peace and comfort as they look to Christ and look forward to the resurrection of the dead. Strengthen them in these days ahead because they will be difficult. Give them peace and comfort. We pray and ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you for the introduction, Pastor. And this has been a true blessing for Michelle and I. I'm not sure how much of a blessing I've been. But I know Michelle is. So, but it, it is great to be here, be part of this church. And uh, Michelle and I have talked about it and how much it reminds us of our home church in Harvard. Really <coughs> does. Just everything about it, the, the welcomingness that you have shown us at our local members, it's, it's been a true blessing for us. And no doubt, the weeks and months ahead is going to continue to be that for us. So we look forward to worshiping with you until May. Um, so today, we're going to go into chapter 2 of Mark, but first I kind of want to go back through and just briefly look at what we talked about, what pastors talked about over the first couple Sundays here, um, kind of the main thoughts that he brought out to some of the things that I think are kind of to get me going in the right direction, because he talked about he wants to stay on topic of the, the big picture of everything. So I'm a little concerned that I might have got bogged down in some details going through chapter um, two. It says I have like 13 pages of notes, but so hopefully, hopefully I will be able to take the big picture out of that. And if, if I go off track, Pastor will get us back next Sunday. So that's my that's my piece of comfort as I think about this. So um, just to recap, um, chapter one starts off really quickly. It gets right to the heart of the matter. So we don't have Jesus as a baby, as an infant. We don't have all of that narrative. You know, we go right to the to the John the Baptist preparing the way for Christ, right into the baptism, then into the temptation of the wilderness, and then Jesus is beginning his ministry already in the first chapter. Calls the first disciples, and he heals a man with an unclean spirit. I believe that's where we left off last week. Was chapter, or I mean, verse twenty-eight, I think, of chapter one, and. We're not just skipping that. Pastor's going to come back and kind of tie up chapter 1 where he left off um, last week. He's going to do that next week, but we decided we'd best if I just go into chapter 2 and get um, into that. So where we didn't really get into last week was the discussion of Jesus begins healing many people. The crowds are growing. His popularity is growing. And he, as he's preaching in Galilee, and it ends with Jesus cleanses a leper. So... I try to keep the big picture in mind as we go through this. And the question that I'm keeping in my head really is, who is Jesus? And what is he showing us about himself as we go through Mark? In one of the introductions I read, of all the Gospels, Mark can probably be described as a passion narrative with an extended introduction. Pastors kind of made that clear. I mean, really the point of this is, is Christ is rushing to the cross. And yeah, we have a lot of activity. It's about the deeds of Christ. But the cross is right there on the horizon. It's well in view. And we're pushing forward towards that. So everything we're talking about, we're keeping that in mind. The cross that's right there on the horizon. But yet, um, that's what Jesus is getting to. So things to remember. Mark, again, is a compiler of Peter's sermons. So everything we have here is... The preaching of Peter, the things that Peter saw, the things that he wrote, um, that's from Peter. And again, Mark is a gospel of action. This sense of immediately, pastor talked about that word, um, immediately. Everything keeps happening immediately. And that's the, that sense of urgency as we're moving through Mark. And just for the fun of it, I counted up how many times immediately occurred in the gospel of Mark. And it's 36 times where that word is used. And if you look at Matthew, um, the first three of the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all three of those Gospels, it's used a total of like 60 times. So we have over half of the uses of the word immediately in Mark. Again, this just points to that Gospel of action, action and the urgency that Pastor 
talks about. And also, I, when I think of this sense of urgency, because it is so important, and I sense that in pastor's preaching and his teaching. So for me, going to the seminary, this is a blessing for me to actually see that in action, the way that you preach and teach, there is a sense of urgency that is necessary uh, to think about as you're doing this. So that's a blessing to see that in pastor. So the deeds of Jesus are emphasized, his work, his miracles. But in no way are the deeds of Jesus isolated from his word. The word that he speaks and preaches is always central to what he's doing. And it's the instrument in his deeds. Jesus speaks and it's done. You know, we see that in the calling of the disciples already in chapter 1. He speaks and they follow now, of course, it's not just like some magician where he just says, you're going to follow me, and they go. They've been hearing his preaching, his word. It's been at work in them, creating faith in their hearts, and that's what, that's what leads them to follow Jesus. I mean, we're not hearing all of the preaching that Jesus has already done towards them. And we'll see that today in Matthew. It's not like Matthew is probably just sitting there in the tax booth, and Jesus walks by and says, you know, come follow me. Matthew most likely has been hearing Jesus preach and teach. The Holy Spirit's working in his heart, so... When Jesus tells Peter or tells Matthew to follow him, he does in faith. And also for us, we shouldn't expect big things in our life to happen outside of God's word. It would be nice sometimes if we could see big and amazing things to happen in our lives. We could look at those things like, see, that's what God's doing, which he is working in our life. But sometimes we don't know how, because often it's through trials and suffering. And Tom Mates' family is going through that now. But God is with them intimately working with his word and his Holy Spirit through this. So we always look and see what God is telling us in his word. All right. So John the Baptist propels us forward. Then Jesus comes, as the pastor said, and he makes a home in our heart. And we're going to kind of focus on this first part of chapter 2, the scene, the setting is actually the home. So Jesus has come from the wilderness, the temptation of Satan, and comes back from that and begins his ministry. So this ministry of action, it almost feels like it kind of, it doesn't take a pause, but just a little bit, because we go into the home of Jesus. And we'll talk more about that. And he also mentioned how Jesus comes and goes to war, to battle against things on this earth. Satan, specifically Satan, we pointed to, I believe it was 1 John, where Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. And we see this playing out. So everything that is happening here, Jesus with all his works, he's at battle. So we'll see him in his house today, sitting there teaching and healing. But he's at battle, in the midst of the war, for all of us, not just for them then, but also for us now. So Jesus is the kingdom of God on earth, goes to war and invasion, all the while marching forward to the cross. So let's go ahead and I want to just read chapter 2 because I'm trying to stick with the big picture instead of just going through it bit by bit, I want to just read the chapter. And I've broken it down into, well not myself, but it's kind of broken down into two parts. The first part is Jesus heals a paralytic and then Jesus calls Levi. Those two sections, verses 1 through 17, really the theme with those is forgiveness. That's the focus. And then the, the chapter ends, the question about fasting, and Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. The theme changes as it ends, and it's kind of about the old ways versus the new ways. <coughs> so in, in reality, we'll probably only get through the first part of forgiveness. Maybe, hopefully, we'll get through that. So, I'm going to just begin reading on or chapter 2, verse 1. Jesus heals a paralytic. And when he returned to Capernaum, after some days it was reported that he was at home, and many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door, but he was preaching the word to them. And they came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him, and when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the scribes were sitting there, questioning in their hearts, Why does this man speak like that? He's blaspheming. 
Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately, Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they questioned within themselves, said to them, Why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Rise, take up your bed, and walk. That but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, Rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose, and immediately picked up his bed, and went out before them all, so that they were all amazed, and glorified God, saying, We never saw anything like this. And Jesus calls Levi. He went out beside the sea, and all the crowd was coming to him, and he was teaching them. And as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax booth, and said to him, Follow me. And he rose and followed him. And as he reclined at table in his house, many tax collectors and sinners were reclining with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. And the scribes and the Pharisees, when they saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, said to the disciples, Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? And when Jesus heard it, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. And I'm going to stop there. I won't finish the next, because this whole first section there that I read, really the theme is forgiveness, and I kind of want to just stay with that, and if we get to the second section, we'll uh, read that. So, the first two verses. Jesus is at Capernaum, which is his home. Um, and Capernaum is in Galilee, which I wish I had a map, but I'm, most of you probably kind of know the, where Jesus did his ministry. If we have a, well, I'm not even going to try to draw a picture of um, Galilee, but it's the northern section of where Jesus did, where when we think of the Holy Land, Galilee is up here, then you have Samaria, then you have Judea, which is down low, where Jerusalem's at. So this is taking place up here in Galilee. Jesus' home now is in Capernaum, which is on the northwest side of the Sea of Galilee. So that's just to kind of put it in its place. And we read in Luke 2, what well, we have it here, but prior to the events that have happened already, there's been some other things that have taken place. Jesus has already been, at this point, been rejected in his hometown in Nazareth. When I say hometown, I mean childhood town, which he moved from Nazareth, now living in Capernaum for his ministry. He's already been rejected there. We read that in Luke. And also, kind of interesting, I think, that since everything is taking place in his hometown of Capernaum, he's doing all these mighty works there. If we read in Matthew 11, 21 to 24, if you don't have to go there, I will go there real quick. My wife has already kind of made fun of me for not having um, notes and using this computer. But I must admit, I've fully given myself over to the riches of technology. So I don't, I don't know that that's a good thing, but I have, and I've just, I've tried to not do it, and I'm so, I'm just pathetic, I guess. So I just do it, and I just go with it. So it's like it's become my brain. It's all right here. Um, so Jesus, in, this is in Matthew 11, and it's, this is the woe to unrepentant cities. And he says, but I tell you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for Tyre and Sidon than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? You will be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I tell you that it will be more tolerable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom than for you. So he's speaking this to Capernaum, who has witnessed his mighty works there. So I just thought it was kind of interesting to put that into context. And Jesus at his hometown <coughs> in Capernaum, which he eventually speaks this way about. All right. So Jesus in his hometown. His fame is spread. So at this point, Jesus is literally like a rock star. I mean, to put it, you know, in today's terms, he has a huge following because of everything that he's doing. His miracles, really, that's why, you know, people are coming to him because they're getting their earthly problems fixed and taken care of. But at the same time, they're receiving his word, his teaching. If you go to, I just want to jump back to chapter 1, just because it kind of helps make the transition into this. So, Mark 1, the last two verses, actually just the last verse, after he's healed or cleansed the leper, 
But he went out and began to talk freely about it. This is the leper that was cleansed. He's going out and he's been healed. So he's telling everybody. And, that, and to spread the news so that Jesus could no longer openly enter a town. Because everybody wants to know where Jesus is at. They want to be where Jesus is at. But he was out in desolate places. So Jesus, for the time being, we don't know how long, but he's out in desolate places, staying away somewhat from the crowds. And people were coming to him from every corner. And then he goes back to Capernaum. And of course, they know where he's at. And the word spreads, and everybody shows up at his house. So you can just imagine the scene where this starts out. Everybody's at Jesus' house. The crowd, I mean, it's packed inside, and it's obviously packed outside because you can't get to the door. You can't get into, um, you can't even get into Jesus because of all the people there. So then the focus turns. Well, it starts. What, what is Jesus doing in the house? Preaching. He's preaching. Yeah, he's preaching his word. Now, are all the people coming there just because they want to hear Jesus preach? No. I mean, realistically, no. They're coming there because they're hoping that they can get something good from Jesus or maybe see him heal. So these four men um, bring this man. And again, this points to who is Jesus. And I have one, I guess I have one question as I'm thinking about this because Jesus is preaching his word, but central to much of this and his fame is all of the healings that are taking place. I. We're going to get to this question, I know, as more as we go through Mark. But why healing? Why is Jesus healing? And I don't know if I want to even address that now, but it's just in my head as we're going through this, because we're going to keep centering on Jesus preaching, but also healing. So is there any thoughts of why Jesus is healing? What is the point of this? Yes? He, he gets people's attention that yeah. way. He does, he, definitely. he does, definitely. Right. Um, to show his authority. It could be also just to show his authority. But there's also something that's interesting, because even though he's healing, he's casting out demons, he tells the people what? That are healed. Don't, don't tell anyone. Yeah, don't tell anyone. Be quiet. So there's this messianic secret, and we'll get into that more. But at the same time, he doesn't want people to know. So get the point, I guess, maybe what I'm thinking of. Is Jesus just doing this to show his power? That he's powerful, he's God. No, he's a shepherd. Right. He feels for his well. That's that's where I was going with it, exactly. <laughs> that's what I was thinking. And that's what I've heard before. I mean, Jesus really is centered in who he is, his compassion. And that's always has the cross on the focus. He doesn't, we don't put our well, sometimes we do, I shouldn't say this, because often when we do this, we find <coughs> peace and comfort in God's power. He's almighty. So we find comfort in that. But I don't, really, what does that do for, I mean, comfort, how does that comfort us? Because often we think God's almighty, he's powerful, then he should be able to just fix all of our problems right now. So then finding sim simply peace and comfort in his almighty power kind of leaves us with questions. And that's why I like, yes, he's our shepherd, he loves us, he cares for us. There's a compassion there. Almost like he can't, Help, but when he comes into contact with these sick and dying, his compassion flows out. And he fixes them, he heals them. Because this isn't the main problem. The sickness and the demon possession, all of this, this isn't the main problem. What is the main problem? All of this is a symptom of the big problem. Yes, exactly. The sin of the world. And he doesn't come to fix the sin of the world by just snapping his fingers and saying, yep, it's all better. No, he becomes one of us in the flesh, and he suffers, and he dies. It points to the foolishness of the cross that makes no sense to us. We would so often in our flesh want to see God just fixes everything, makes it better now, and doesn't lead us to suffer. That's not how God works. But in that, there's comfort. Yes? I think also that... By healing the body, it frees the mind. Uh, when you are in pain, you don't really think of anything else but your pain. How to avoid it, and since they didn't have any kind of big medicine, yeah. uh, I think once the body is healed, the brain is ready to accept <coughs> the forgiveness and the realization that they are sinners. We are sinners. And I see what you're saying. And 
Also, though, God comes to us even when we're in those moments, though, you know, of suffering and pain. And we're our mind, what you're saying, our mind wants to think about the pain that we're in the suffering. That is very true. That's why we, what do we turn to? We don't turn to our feeling, our emotion, what we're experiencing in that moment. That's the only thing we can do at that time is turn to what God has told us in his word. And then we find the peace and the comfort. Because we don't always get better in this life. Actually, we never actually get better in this life. We're all going to get to the point where we're at a place that we really don't want to be even more so than now. But God doesn't abandon us in those times. He comes to us with his word. We may not feel better, but he still speaks to us the things that we need. Now, so go to this, this format. Let me get ahead to where I need to be. So the four men, they bring this man. You can just imagine the scene that is taking place there. I mean, I, again, try to picture this, what's going on there in this house. And I did just brief research. Again, I don't want to get tied up in little minor details, but the house that they were in, what little research I did. I mean, it would have been a small, probably square house with a flat roof. Um, the roofs of these, I'm reading this, the roofs of the dwellings of common people in Israel were made of wooden beams placed across stone or also like a mud brick walls. And then these, the beams were covered with reeds and matted with layers of thorns and then several inches of clay. So you have all this piled up on top of this roof. So just imagine these four men are coming there and they're thinking, you know what, we got Joe here on the, whatever they're carrying him on this bed. So we know Jesus is here. Let's just see if he can take care of him, fix it. And so this is really why, I mean, this is why they're going there. And they get there, they can't get to Jesus because everybody's in the house. And so they find a way to get up. But apparently in these houses there was some sort of a ladder or even a stair type that you would have to get up on to like, I don't know, clean the roof or fix it or whatever. So, but you can imagine, because you're going to hear these guys going up this ladder and stairs or whatever, and then coming on to the roof. And then they have to dig through everything branches, the leaves, the mud, the clay, whatever, to, to get Jesus down there. So, I mean, it's, this task is not easy. It's kind of dangerous. So when you talk about Tom coming to church under the circumstances he did, I'm like, you know, it's kind of like these men getting their brother to see Jesus. You know, Tom had the people, his family that loved him, they got him to see Jesus last week, and that's what he did. So imagine this, where they, now they probably have stuff falling down through there, and everybody says, what is going on? And then they try to lower him down through this. It had to be just chaotic. I can't imagine. So it's kind of like, then, boom, here he is right in front of Jesus. All right, Jesus, what are you going to do now, sort of thing. <laughs> <laughs> and Jesus probably thinks, now I'm going to have to hire somebody. To exactly. Hire now, yeah, I didn't, I didn't even think of that. Now he's <laughs> yeah. thinking rough now. Not going to use it to find. But he's a carpenter, so it's a freebie. That's true. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe he'll show up as union buddies. There you go. <laughs> so, what we have, well, also to put more in context. So you got this happening. He's being let down there. But who else is in this house besides the sinners, the crowds, the people who want healing? Who else is in here? The scribes and Pharisees. Okay, yes, the Pharisees, the scribes. And what are they doing now? It says, I believe, that they're, well, I mean, we know what they're doing, but they're, imagine it's packed in there, it's standing room only. It's like being in the doctor's office, where they're standing room only. But what are these guys doing? They're sitting down, which is, I mean, this points to what they think about themselves. So they have put themselves into, the, into a place of, of honor, yeah, because Jesus will talk about it later, I, I think, in Maybe it's Mark 12, or maybe it's Matthew 12, where, you know, the scribes, the Pharisees, they went to the seats of honor. So this is what they have right in the house. They're sitting down because they think so highly of themselves. While everybody else is sick around them, literally the sick, and the, the doctor's actually there, and they put themselves in this place of honor, like you said, now. Exactly. So that's kind of the context that we have going on here. Jesus points to their faith. What does he say about their faith? Does he say, I perceive it, or I feel, or perceive their faith in my spirit? What does he actually say when he's talking about their faith? They don't have much. Well, no, this is also true. And I, I'm talking about, so the four men that are bringing, yes, the four men that are bringing, 
what did they say? What does Jesus say about their faith? A lot. Let me see which verse this is. Yeah, it says, when they could there remove the roof, Jesus, it's verse 5, and when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. So imagine this. I mean, everybody's thinking, okay, they're going to let this guy down, and Jesus is going to be like, well, this is going to be like one of the biggest miracles he's done when this guy stands up and starts walking. But what does he do right away? Son, your sins are forgiven. So everybody is probably very confused at this point. And this leads to kind of the situation. But this saw, he saw their faith. So what is, what is, what is this? What can we say about this? Any thoughts on he saw their faith? Now, when we talk about our faith, when we talk about my faith, like I have great faith. Jack probably has much better faith than me. I'm sure. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know about that. <laughs> no. That's not, my point is, no, that's not how we talk about it. Even if we could. They saw their faith because they believed. Right, so is it just a matter that they have such great faith? Wow, look at them. We should be like these four men. We should do great things like these four men. Is that how we look at faith? Right, because the action is finding help where? In Jesus, yeah. So our faith, it's not about our great faith, it's that we all have faith. And all the faith that we have has an object. And what is the object? Who is the object? It's Jesus. So right faith knows where to go for help. It goes to Jesus. So that's what these men are doing. They're coming to Jesus. They just get so much more than what they have actually bargained for. And they don't realize this faith that Jesus has created in them through the teaching of his word is so much more than earthly healing. <laughs> Ultimately, that's not it, because, again, this is not the ultimate problem Jesus came to fix on this earth. If it was, none of us would be sick or have any problems. That's why we come here often, is because we needed Jesus to forgive us, to strengthen us, to get us through this life. <laughs> So then again, what is, what is faith? We could ask, I suppose, at this point. It's a gift. It is a gift, right. It's not something that we can do or create within ourselves. It's given to us. Where can we even say that we've got faith the first time?
Not all of us, but a lot of us, I guess, we could say this. Yeah. And the baptism, yeah. I mean, not everybody was baptized as an infant, but God works through hearing His Word to give us faith. And Hebrews 11, 1 says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. And so often what we want is things that we see, but what we're given is not what we see. We can't see the forgiveness, which this will get to a point later on in this. Luther, this is kind of, I kind of like this Luther quote on faith. Again, faith and the works that flow from faith. We have to be careful not to make works anything that give us salvation, because they don't. We cannot contribute anything to our salvation with works. What Luther says, I like what he says, he says, faith, however, is a divine work in us which changes us and makes us to be born anew of God. It kills the old Adam and makes us altogether different men in heart and spirit and mind and powers. And it brings with it the Holy Spirit. Oh, it is a living and busy, active, mighty thing, this faith. It is impossible for it not to be doing good works incessantly. It does not ask what the good works to be done, but before the question is asked, it's already done them. It is constantly doing them. Thus, it is impossible to separate works from faith. Quite as impossible to separate heat and light from fire. So where there is faith, there will be works. It's our works that save us, but they're part of our faith that we've been given, just in the simple things that we do. And the best thing that our faith does for us is a work it brings us to Jesus. Now, move on to verse, I'm going to go through verses 6 through 12 again. This is the forgiveness, the scribes sitting there in their hearts, and they say, why does this man speak like this? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? They're, they're pretty smart. <laughs> They've got to figure it out. Almost, but not quite. And immediately, Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves, said to him, them, why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise, take up your bed, and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose immediately, picked up his bed, and went out before them all. So they were all amazed, glorified God, and saying, we never saw anything like this. So the scribes, and it says, it says the scribes of the Pharisees. So these are probably the scribes that are Pharisees. They're very highly intelligent men. And their work, I mean, this is what they do. They read and they write. Their education makes them very indispensable in many, it says, many civilizations. They were needed to help. So they would work in the military, the government, legal and financial records. But specifically here, they're interpreters, basically, of yeah, scripture. Yeah, so we're thinking like the Old Testament, the laws of God. They're interpreting this. So they would have been associated with the Pharisees who sought to broaden the application of the law. So they're really interested because Jesus has been teaching and preaching, and he's a Jew. So they're going to be scrutinizing every little thing that comes out of Jesus' mouth to see if it's fitting in with what they know, because they're smart, they've studied, they've done it. They're going to see if what he's saying fits with what they know about being righteous. So they've been watching it. They've seen everything that's happening. They think that they know who God is. And this new teacher, Jesus, he just isn't fitting into their understanding of an expert in all things pertaining to God. And it only gets worse. So, Jesus goes right to the heart of the matter, though, with these scribes, these Pharisees. So immediately after speaking forgiveness, Jesus knows what's going on and asks them, goes right to their heart. Again, we have to remember, this is Jesus at war with Satan, with sin, and our, and our flesh. Because our flesh always wants to look to ourselves to find hope, to find a righteousness within ourselves. And that's what these scribes, the Pharisees, are doing. They aren't looking outside of themselves. They believe that their salvation is going to be found through keeping the law perfectly in their lives and how they live. This is their hope and their comfort. So a lot of things took place in those verses. Jesus saying, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed and go home. You're forgiven, you're healed. 
it, it makes me, I mean, there's so much comfort in this verse. Because, I mean, this is for us, too. And we have to remember that when we come to church here, essentially, this is what Jesus does for us every time. I mean, the work that he's did back then is not different than what he's doing right now. We come in here. We get healed and forgiven. And essentially, he's saying, All right, he says to us, rise, go back home. Your sins are forgiven. We are healed once again. It's an ongoing thing that Jesus is doing with us throughout our life. That's why church is so important to be here. You know, not as entertainment, but I mean, it's literally a matter of life or death to be here. It really is. So the urgency that Pastor keeps talking about, it is urgent to be in church. And, and Tom is such a, a great example of faith, because we can look at people as examples of faith, not because he did something amazing or great, but what he did was come here, and Jesus took care of him, he forgave him, and he took him to the grave in Jesus. It's, it's so comforting. So some of the points, I guess, to this, I, I think I'm skipping over a lot of things that I probably wanted to make um, note of, but again, I read too many things here, so if I'm jumping over anything, you want me to like, go back and come or just raise your hand and ask a question, yes, Jesus. You have to wonder about the paralytic when Jesus told him to rise. Here he's been laying in his bed for how long we don't know. Obviously, he had faith to come to Jesus, but right. to actually act on that faith and act on that command. No, oh, yes. Somewhat um, mm -hmm. amazing. Yeah, I mean, can you imagine that? Still, that, that whole scene that, to try to imagine that, and then him actually standing up, and then everybody watching him. It's just, yeah. I mean, because it's, I mean, it's. Horrible enough being probably a quadriplegic, I don't know what he was, probably. But in this day and age, it's, it's, it's horrible and not anything that you want for anyone. But can you imagine in the first century being in this condition? You know, with, it's, you know, with everything that we have now today, I mean, you can live in some comfort. But back then, I mean, you're at the mercy of just everything. It would be so, so, yeah, I can't even imagine with that. So that rise, pick your bed, go home. You're, you're better. It's fine now. But the real thing that he gave him, the real healing that he gave him was uh, forgiveness. No therapy. Yeah. No, no physical therapy. No, no physical therapy. <laughs> no, this, yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. So then, what is forgiveness? Because this is what Jesus came to do, to give us forgiveness. And I want to go to the Old Testament just to kind of put a picture on forgiveness. Because there's some verses in the Old Testament that I just, I love because they're so comforting and how they speak about forgiveness. It's easy to say kind of, you know, yeah, we're forgiven. Or, you know, we forgive each other. Yeah, you're forgiven. Or so often our response is, that's ah, no big deal, don't worry about it. <laughs> we should, should say, when somebody apologizes to us, don't say it's no big deal. It is a big deal. So I forgive you. So our forgiveness from Jesus is the biggest deal because it restores us. It's not just like, ah, oh, you're good now. No, it actually restores us to a right relationship with God. Because that's the problem that happened in the Garden of Eden. We fell away from God and into sin. And we were separated from God. But Jesus came to fix that. And he fixes that by going to the cross and dying and then rising again. So it's a, it's a restoration to God. And the sin and the sins that we commit, gone. So let's go first to Micah 7, 18 to 19. Micah 7, 18 to 19. Now, uh, of course, I would give you page numbers, but I can't, so. If anybody wants to give a page number, feel free. Micah 7, 18 to 19. So this is just thinking about forgiveness. What is forgiveness? Forgiveness. Who is a God like you? This is verse 18. No way, just a second. I know, finding Micah, that's like... It's 992. Even, even when I have to look up Micah, I know that I should, should have memorized my Old Testament um, books of the Bible better in confirmation. <laughs> Especially the minor prophet ones. All right, so verse 18, Micah 7, 18. Who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity and passing over transgression for the remnant of his inheritance? He does not retain his anger forever, because he delights in steadfast love. 
He will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. And this is the part. You will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. So those that last sentence, you will cast all of our sins into the depths of the sea. That's what he did this morning. During absolution, when we received communion, the body of Christ, he took our sins once again and cast them into the sea. We're, we are forgiven, we've been forgiven, and we keep being forgiven. And there's comfort in that. That's why we come here, because he keeps doing this for us. So once again, our sins are cast into the sea. Now go to Isaiah 43, 25. Isaiah 43, 25. Where it's coming from. 
Because again, Jesus talks how all of Scripture point to him. And when he says this, he's talking about the Old Testament. So go to Daniel 7, 13 to 14. Daniel 7, 13 to 14. Son of Man is given dominion. So in this verse, we're going to get the Son of Man and also the Ancient of Days, which I know you also talked about in Revelation. So 13 through 14. I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like the Son of Man. And he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and kingdom, that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. So Jesus is referring to this prophecy of him as the Son of Man, the one who is to come. And the Ancient of Days, again to test your revelation knowledge, is who is the Ancient of Days? Father. Yes, God the Father. What chapter of Revelation? <laughs> so if if we go to chapter 5 in Revelation, then, which is very comforting because this is all kind of tied together because Revelation comes, you know, on this end of things. But in chapter 5, you have the Ancient of Days, which is God the Father, but also you have the Son of Man standing in heaven, reigning as the slain Lamb of God. And I know you've talked about this, so I'm not going all back to that, but the point is, Jesus is referring to himself as this Son of Man who is also right now the slain Lamb of God in heaven. It's comfort for them. Then, it's comfort for us right now. I think probably everybody that was hearing this knew about Daniel. Mm -hmm. right. Right. So right. they would jump right on to that. Right. Yes. But a lot of people don't understand that. And, the, you know, there's more to it. It's not just simply that, well, I, you know, I was prophesied as the Son of Man, so here I am. Well, I mean, there's more to that. And, Here's the best explanation. It was one of the commentaries I read on Dr. Feltz. I thought it was a fairly good explanation of the Son of Man. Therefore, for Jesus to call himself the Son of Man is for him to take upon himself the role of humanity. It's focusing on that flesh of him. But to do so as God, the very Son of God. So he's really pointing to the two natures of Christ, God and flesh. Otherwise put, the Son of Man is mankind, reduced to one, but done so in the person of God, the Son of God himself. So it's an expression of the incarnation, God coming to earth in flesh for us. God himself becomes a man. Mankind, humanity, reduced to one in Jesus, where he takes on the sin of everyone from Adam into himself. And it's only through him, because of that incarnation, in flesh and blood, that we have any hope today. It's all about that. It's when we come here again to church, it's all about that, that he came in flesh and then took himself to the cross. So, again, what comfort does this give to us? Well, God is true God and he's true man. He's doing the thing that we can't do. He took on our flesh and he fixed the thing that went wrong in the garden for eternity. Now, any questions? I don't want to just kind of feel like I'm yeah, taking over. I read the scripture and, uh, and I read it just quite a bit. It's a little hard for me to understand everything. Mm -hmm. Right. I'm praying for the Lord that I can. But that really, really, it was really tough. I just got to finish it with that. But then, but then, but then, but then, you know, there's so many things going to happen. You know, you wonder when, how, what's all going to happen. Right. But, I have to say, I must be awful dumb, but I don't understand. <laughs> well, trust me, I don't understand very much either, Jack. And I found some comfort when I heard Pastor when I was walking in here last week. He said it took me like 23 years to get it figured out. So, <laughs> so <laughs> I mean, I figured out much so, better than I did 23 years ago. I still have it all figured out. I, I walked in the, at the last minute, I'm sure that he's got to figure it out now. So. <laughs> but no, there is. That's why we keep focusing. We're going, we go back to that central thing, and that is Jesus Christ crucified for our sins, but not, but alive again, <coughs> risen, and that's the hope and comfort we have for everything in life. 
And so we, I know, we don't all, we don't understand everything. There's things that are hard to understand. There's things that we have questions that we can't answer by going to the Bible. Because God doesn't tell us everything. But he tells us exactly what we do need to know. And that's the important thing. And that's the comfort, Jack, of studying this in yeah. Peter. Peter doesn't get it at all. Yeah, this is he's, very and, and he still doesn't get it even after the resurrection right now. Yeah. And, his, and, his, and his sermons here are kind of helping us because you see this, he's always introducing something at the start. And as we're going to see through the Gospel of Mark, he kind of helps us understand and explain it. Here he introduces the Son of Man, just like we had the Son of God at the beginning, and then we got the centurion, Sirlius is the Son of Man. He's got the Son of Man here, Jesus introducing it, and then at the end he's got Jesus before the council. And who do you, you know, who are you? You know, are you the Christ? Yes, I am. And he says, you'll see the Son of Man seated in, you know, at the right hand of God, yeah. coming on the power you know, yeah. of, of the uh, clouds, the great glory. And they say, this is blasphemy, yeah. because they go back to Daniel, and they, that's that's the guy that's, that's God. Right. And you're saying your God, so it goes back to, who is this guy? Yeah. Yeah. And so Peter says, I didn't get any of this either. <laughs> and, the, and the ruling expert class didn't get any of it. Right. So we're all in the same boat, Jack. Yeah. <laughs> we're all we're all rowing, and we don't know where we're going. Ninety-seven years old, I know I commit sin with my mind, and then you forget to ask for forgiveness because you don't know what you got. What you got? Well, what's going to happen? The Lord's prayer is going to take it away from you. Well, again, so I Jack, think, I think evil. A lot of times, I don't I forget that I did. Yeah, I know. So, Jack, but the point is, you don't. God's not like, well, Jack didn't ask for forgiveness, so he's got a luck today. <laughs> That's, so there's comfort there. Because I used to think that when I was a kid, I would like have to go through all my sins, and I'm going through my hands like, oh, if I went to bed and I didn't ask for forgiveness, I thought, oh no. Well, at least I made it through the night because I would have been in trouble. <laughs> 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 I've seen a naked woman. I've been like hell. <laughs> So, well, the good news is, Jack, you're forgiven. I mean, which... See what you're learning as a seminarian now? I didn't think this was the lesson I was going to hear this morning. you got to be prepared for anything. First Peter 1, he says, Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart, since you have been born again, not a perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. For, again, as here he quotes the Old Testament, all flesh is like grass and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers, the flower fails, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. Yeah, so there you go there. It's all focused on that word that we've been given. And that's what made us new and brought us to life. And that's what, so if we die tonight, we didn't ask for forgiveness. We know we're forgiven because God has created repentance in our heart. He's given us repentance in our heart and we're forgiven. Um, so just quickly, I wanted to tie this in because I knew I was jumping over something. When Jesus said, so verse 5, Son, your sins are forgiven. Um, the translation comes across like, you know, you've been forgiven, sort of. But what Jesus is saying is, right now, what I'm saying to you, right now, your sins are forgiven. It's not like they have been forgiven. He's telling him right now, as I'm speaking this to you, you are forgiven. Um, which well, only, only if you believe in Jesus Christ, and Jesus died on the cross, and God raised him from the dead. If you don't believe that, the sins are not forgiven. Well, right, I mean, he, he, his, what the work that Jesus did is for the whole world. But so what you're doing there essentially is rejecting the forgiveness that he's given you. Um, 
So the only way we can be sorry is because of what he's done with his word and his spirit in our hearts. I guess I wanted to draw this part here. Son, your sins are forgiven. He's saying right now. Right. This reminds me, well, this reminds me, it is, when we think of church, where, where does this happen to us right now today? Because Jesus is in this house, all the people around you. What does it remind you of? <coughs> Family, I'm thinking this family right here. What, the sacrament. Well, the sacrament, but more specific, I guess I'm thinking in there. And we're sitting in there, in the house of God, and Jesus is in our midst. So they're basically having church, and that's what we do here. And Jesus comes to us and says, Your sins are forgiven. And he does it through the sinful man, pastor, at the confession and absolution. And the pastor isn't forgiving our sins because he's some powerful guy. But he's doing it not because of power. No, really, he's not. He's doing it because of the authority that he's been given by Jesus. So it's Jesus that is actually speaking the forgiveness to us of the absolution through pastor. So the thing that happened in that house in Capernaum is the same thing that happens here in church. That's why it's important to come here every Sunday. I know there's some Sundays you can't come here. There's reasons. We all have those at times. But if you can come here, you should be here because Jesus wants to forgive you and to strengthen and forgive you once again. Any concluding thoughts? Um, just what you said, Jesus wants to forgive you. I heard a commentary the other day that, you know, so oftentimes even Christians and unbelievers picture God as a God who goes around and keeps a tally of you did this and you did that. But actually he seeks his, you know, his essence is to love and forget. That's what he seek, seeks and desires to yeah, do. Yeah, it goes to that he's, not, yeah. he's not, you know, he's not seeking out to condemn. He's seeking to, yeah. to say. No, exactly. His, you know, yes, I like the, yeah, like the lost sheep, you know. He pursues that sheep. He's not keeping track of the sheep or that one that got lost. Oh, he's going out to bring him back. Yeah, very good point. Yes. We, also, we must remember that he can be a heart and a soul. So when he saw this paralytic coming in, he already read his soul. He already knew the inside. So that he knew he was there because number one, he believed, and number two, he was there to save all. Right. So, yeah. so we got to remember that, that he believes what's in our hearts and our soul. And yeah, he knows us. I mean, he knows sure. every one of us. Exactly. And he's the one that keeps that. He gave us the faith that keeps it in us. So you're exactly right. Clearly, he knows us better than we know ourselves or everyone know ourselves. And that's the comfort. And I, that's the comfort. I often find when you have children and you wonder why they're doing what they're doing. And you wonder if they're ever going to make it out of this world <laughs> as they should. You just have to remember that God loves them more than you actually do because he's the one that baptized them with faith in their heart. So I take comfort. That's a really good no, I found people doing that often. <laughs> when, when they are, yeah, well, you know what I'm saying. <laughs> I think it's interesting that the phrase starts out with the Son. Christ identifies us not only as Lord, but as a human being. He understands this fellow. Right, very good point. Yeah, how you caught that? Yeah, I didn't even think about that. Right. Because Jesus is, is like a brother to us. And it goes back to the family. That's, I'm not going to, well, I only got through, I guess we made it out of the house, I think. We see. We're still out of the house. 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 We're still out you are the one that comes to us, and you create faith in our hearts, and you keep coming to us over and over again, and forgiving us our sins, and strengthening us, and giving us exactly what we need to go back into this world, and to deal with our trials and our suffering. So we just ask that you continue to keep coming to us. Forgive us, and strengthen our faith for life eternal. In Jesus' name. Amen.